When we look at cardiovascular training, which is obviously really important, aerobic training as well, and anaerobic, um, there's lots of research, for example, that's put out now around the Norwegian 4x4 being a really effective way to train your VO2 max or doing like one minute sprints on and off and, and oscillating. None of these workouts actually take very long because even the Norwegian 4x4 is like 28 minutes, I think, because it's four minutes on, three minutes off, and it's pretty intense. Um, what would you say here for women? Like where should our focus be? And does that research hold its own in relation to women? Those are all typical high intensity interval training sessions. Those are true high intensity interval training sessions. People think they're new and novel because they're just now hitting the mainstream. They've been around in high performance sport forever. And when you're thinking about what is high performance sport versus the general pop, general pop thinks that high intensity is a spin class or a very boot boot camp, right? And that's what they're used to with high intensity. So then when you come out and go, look, if we're doing a really hard workout, that's a true high intensity session, like the Norwegian four by four, this comes stock standard out of endurance racing and high performance. It's all about being able to build lactate tolerance and build that top in VO2. Same with one minute on one minute off. It's a very short amount of time, but that still fits into high intensity interval training. Neither one of those fit into sprint interval training, which is that subset, but they are true high intensity interval training sessions. Um, and they're very beneficial because they do help with lactate production. They do help with building that um, top end aerobic capacity or VO2. And again, it's about moving well with muscle economy and building muscle that's going to help as a glucose sink that helps with insulin resistance, right? So we're thinking about all the forward things that are going to help with longevity. And the more the research is coming out, it's still all pointing to short, sharp, we want to look at how we're perturbing the body so we have a really strong stress and it recovers from it through resistance training and the different modalities of resistance training through the cardiovascular work. And we were doing comparison in literature between low intensity and high intensity with cognition and brain health. And when we're looking, it's like, yeah, well, people always are always saying that the low intensity aerobic exercise helps with BDNF. Sure, it's a miracle grow. But what you also need is to plant the seed. So if you get miracle grow and the seed, wouldn't you pick that so that you can actually grow the neural network that you want? That comes with high intensity work and strength training. So there's always like nuances within the literature of what we should be doing. So we actually need both is what you're saying. If you're short on time, though, you still get BDNF and the neural changes with the high intensity. Yeah. And with things like squats, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah. so actually prioritizing, the, if you're short on time, prioritizing the resistance work and the high intensity uh, mm -hmm. first, and then you can use that zone two for recovery, like as you mental called, stress, think, soul you know, food, that type soul of food. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And also improves blood flow, right? You're going to recover faster from your lifts and things. Yeah, yep. yeah. Um, when you look at that, you just made a distinction there between high intensity and sprint training. Sprints are much shorter uh, and faster, harder, right? They're all out 100 kind of or super maximal. Yes. And they have longer recovery. So yes. people are like, doesn't Tabata count? I'm like, no, because you can't hit the intensity you need to in a Tabata session. Tabata, you can put in high intensity work if you can move well enough to get your heart rate up really high in the 20 seconds. But if we're thinking about sprint interval training, it's as hard as you possibly can go for 20 to 30 seconds. And you have at least two minute recovery in between. And the recovery is bringing your heart rate down, resetting central nervous system, allowing your body to regenerate ATP so that you can hit that, that sprint again as hard as you possibly can. So with sprint interval training, it's as hard as you can with lots of recovery. And you might only do two or three of those 20 to 30 seconds because that's all you can generate from a power perspective and maintain that intensity. When we're looking at the high intensity interval training, the variability of the recovery is there for metabolic play. What I mean by that is when we're doing sprint interval, that's more about that top end neural network trying to create epigenetic change from myokine responses. We're looking at high intensity interval training. This is more working the metabolic aspect of let's build some lactate and really be able to clear it out as well as work the aerobic capacity at a higher level. We're right at threshold that's going to help boost that VO2. 
So when we're looking at this, if someone um, is trying to choose how many different workouts they're doing here, right, we could have these very short, sharp sprints, which I, I find just like bolt on really well to an upper body day because I haven't used my legs at all and it's very efficient. Um, if I was doing something like that VO2 max style training, right, the Norwegian four by four or the sprints, I most likely would do that as its own session. Um, Absolutely. Because- yeah, because it involves quite a bit of recovery afterwards, right? And I wouldn't do it after leg day. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's when I see my no. HRV tank. <laughs> it's not a yeah. good strategy. Um, yes. So if someone's looking at this and they're thinking, okay, hang on, there's a lot of things here. And there'll be some people who feel a bit overwhelmed and other people like me who just love exercising who are like, I want to do it all. And then they're going to be like on the floor. How might they like, uh, if we look at across seven days, I've, I've seen you talk about we actually become more resilient and we manage our cortisol better when we do high, high intensity training. So there's this misconception that if I'm struggling with stress, I mustn't do it. How can mm-hmm. we optimize for this, Stacey? I want everyone to think about quality over quantity. Because we've all come from the whole uh, calories in, calories out, fat burning workouts, the longer the better, all that kind of stuff. And we need just to reframe it and take away that mentality. We want to think about high quality, low volume work. So it could be three times a week where you're going to do two total body heavy strength compound days, finishing with some sprint work. So that could be battle ropes, explosive kettlebell swings, it could be assault bike, any kind of thing, right? It could be running up some stairs. And that way you're getting uh, four sessions done in two days. So this is where you're just putting a little bit of the actual proper sprint style stuff, the 20 seconds or less. Exactly. At it would call them a sprint finisher, or if you need a little bit more time to prime and warm up for your strength training session, then often people will do it first at the start. Because a 10 minute sitting on, t- on a bike for 10 minutes to quote warm up for a strength training session doesn't really do anything. If you really want to warm up and prime everything, you got to get some sprint action in there, get that heart rate up. You can warm up a little bit, then do your sprints and then get into your heavy lifting. But you can also do it in the reverse because I know there are some days where I'm like, I can't face bringing my heart rate up really high, but I can really get in there and lift heavy. And then at the end, I'm like, yeah, I've got a little bit more. I'm going to do some battle ropes because I've just totally killed my my legs from leg day, right? (laughs) So there's options there. And then one other day of the week, you're doing a true high intensity interval session. So that would be your Nordic four by fours. So you end up with five sessions in three days or in three actually marked out times that you're going to the gym. And then if you have the bandwidth and the ability to have some soul food time, do it. That's the thing about the zone two stuff. It's not off limits. It's just when we're prioritizing, want to think about quality over quantity and then any leftover stuff, that's when you can play around a bit. I think the other thing that's happened with zone two, right, is that it stopped being relaxing because everyone's become obsessed with the fact that they must be at the top of zone two. And I know when I was interviewing Paul Larson, he was like, do you know what even zone one counts? It like, it works really well for your endocrine health, your immune system, just get out there, like go for a nature walk and enjoy it. And I think that's just, I don't know, that just feels so freeing to not think that you have to go, am I at the top? Do you know what I mean? Because you see the rows with their weighted vests on and like, am I right at the top and what's like 180 minus my age and I have I hit that and now it's actually not relaxing at all when you start to do that and they're never in zone two when they do that because they are thinking they're at the top end but most of them have crossed over and it's too too hard because when we're looking at using heart rate metric heart rate is like a whistle on a clipboard for a coach it's very variable there's so many different things that affect heart rate so it's better to go by rating of perceived exertion And I don't really think the public's been educated on what is true zone two. I mean, I'm laughing that there are um, wearable companies that have come out with zone one or zone zero. It's like, you're just living, right? It's like, there's no such thing as zone zero. There's nothing scientific about zone zero. You call it a relaxed state and, or, you know, just recovery. So when you start Mixing that in as well, it really confuses people because they're like, well, I thought zone two was a just right above the the fast walking state. Yeah, but now it's like, no, you got to push a little bit more and we have to do the talk, talk test. Now that's too hard. So people need to dial it down because that's the problem is they get so focused on hitting these metrics because they've heard so much about it, but they don't think they really know what those metrics are. 
Zone zero has really confused me because I saw that come up on my whoop and it was quite new. And I was like, what is zone zero? Because like, is that, does that basically mean that I'm not moving? Um, it also, anything that's wrist borne, I've found is a very kind of inaccurate way anyway, because like if you're doing a sprint, it won't even show the heart rate until you finished and then you're in recovery and you're like, I don't even know if I'm recovering quickly enough. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't, I find that if I'm looking at heart rate, it has to be with a chest strap. Absolutely. I mean, like if I get on the Watt bike and do a Zwift workout, it never ever pegs a high intensity. I only get on Zwift to do sprint workouts or high intensity work, short, sharp, and it's at home. So I don't have to worry about getting hit by a car if I'm out on my bike, but it never registers. Never. It always like, oh, that was a really nice recovery ride. I'm like, what are you kidding? I was pushing 230 watts for three minutes. And those are my three minute intervals. I'm like at top end. So don't tell me that was recovery. So when they come out with zone zero, it's like, what are you talking about? There, There's no scientific basis to be calling it zone zero. It's all marketing. It's to make people go, oh, okay, I can spend some time at 50% or below. And that's just living. That's like getting up and moving around your day making breakfast with kids or yourself, getting in and out of the car. And they're just trying to quantify that daily existence. But there is no exercise physiology science to show what a zone zero is. The zones were designed to be able to quantify workload during exercise sessions to be able to say, okay, we want your heart rate to be 50% or less. So we're going to call that zone one so that you know what recovery is. We want you to hit the top end of your metrics to work on VO2. In a color coding, we're calling it that zone um, five or six. So that's at your top end of your heart rate. But it's all about being able to rate according to heart rate and rating perceived exertion to quantify training loads. It's not about quantifying what's on your wearable. So I find it, again, this is where marketing is trumping science and people are really buying into it. It's like, it's just living. It's just your daily life. You don't need to quantify well, yeah. it. Yeah, it's interesting because there's also a new thing that's come up, which is your biological age, which I can't see any kind of basis for because it's just on a wrist-borne measurement. And it starts to basically rate me according to movement, even though, for example, I might have had, I might have been working and podcasting and doing things that are more sedentary, but then I might have done a really intense workout, but it will then downgrade me because today I didn't quite make the steps. But then when I look at, as in when I say the steps, the ones that I normally make, right, which tend to be 12,000 plus. But when I look at the longevity science, it seems most of the benefits come in around 8,000 steps anyway. So I find it super confusing because I think people who maybe don't have any training in this area will be looking at it and going, oh my God, my age is going up. I'm going to, I have to get out more and I have to do this, but they're not necessarily actually like putting a physiological strain on the system in the way that you're talking about that drives a benefit. Correct. And the other thing about steps is the 10,000 steps, it comes from a marketing campaign in the 1960s. So people are always like, oh, I got to get my 10,000 steps. It's like, yes, movement is great. Any incidental movement is great, but you don't have to target a certain amount of steps. Because I'll have women who go, oh, how many steps should I get? In addition to all the training I'm doing, I do I have to go out at the end of the day and try to get an extra 5,000 steps? I'm like, no, what are you talking about? The steps are there to make sure that you are incidentally moving throughout the day. So you're, sit you're sitting, you're standing, you're walking around, you're parking far away from where you need to go. And then you can have focused training. But if you're so obsessed with numbers from wearables, you're missing the mark. And that's the part that's frustrating. 